Hello, nice to meet you. Well, welcome to the Swan Youth Centre. This is our youth centre. Uh, I'm hoping that you'll challenge one of them too. <laughs> well, first, thank you very much for coming okay, to uh, share a little moment. It's a conversation. I'm not here to tell you. I've never done so. And actually, my, the story of my success has been able to listen rather than to tell people. Listen to what's inside of me because at a young age, your age, I was wrongly directed. Very wrongly directed. It was a time when the parents didn't choose and neither the pupil. Somebody else made a choice for you as what you would do in your life. And my teachers decided that I should be an architect. And I went to the very specialized schools and I was miserable, terribly miserable. Melancholic, because I hated triangles, <laughs> I hated trapezes, I hated rectangles, square boxes, and I loved anything which was asymmetric. And I decided I will not stay here. I want to find my passion. I want to find the, the little, because we, all of us, you've got to realize, each of us has got a little gift. We've all been given something that some of us discover, some of us don't. Sometimes there's a bit of luck, but most of the time is searching for that little gift. Most of the time we don't spend enough time searching. So first, I would like to ask you to search. <coughs> Especially in that lovely moment, well, not, al not always lovely, but because adolescence now is much more complicated than it used to be. To me, I was a, I'm a post-war boy, and adolescence was marvelous. Truly, growing up was a joy. Whereas now, the expectation of society, all the, the, the incredible uh, pressure which is put on young people, is very tough, guys, and you've got all my sympathy. Uh, I have uh, two young sons, okay, so I understand okay, the, the trauma that you can go through. But still, that, that doesn't forgive you to search for that little gift in you, because you all have it. So, for telling you a little story, I want to finish my story. So I looked for my little gift. And it took me years, I became a nurse. Because I thought, I love people. And being a nurse is a wonderful <coughs> way to show you love people. And I ended up into a leukemia department, where young people about your age were dying. And I saw about 12 young people dying in this, uh, in this hospital, which was Hospital saint anne and I couldn't take it. I just simply couldn't take it to see such very dramatic experiences. I, I couldn't. And equally, the sisters were matrons, Catholic masons, and they were terrible. Okay? And uh, a, a few times I was caught in cupboards okay, with nurses, so that didn't go too well. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> We didn't know that. Yeah, so, we didn't know okay, that. we, we passed, pass. okay? Uh, but mostly because I couldn't take it. Then I became an art student because I thought I could draw. And I went to an art school. And I realized I couldn't draw because I could see <laughs> the people who could draw. So, okay, it's not for me. You're good, but not that good. So I went searching. Then I went to a factory. Oh, terrible experience. A factory. Think of what the word factory means. When you talk about factory, what is a factory? <laughs> Can you just give me a word, just one word. What do you think? Great building. Mm? <laughs> Big building. <laughs> factory. <laughs> factory. Oh, just a word. Think of a word. The emotion you have when I say factory. Boring. 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 <laughs> Big boring. What does boring boredom does to people? It kills them. <laughs> it, it kills the entrepreneurship that we all have, our ideals, okay? 
Come on, give me some notes. Some we're talking about here. Pollution. Pollution. Quite right. Pollution as I say, badly ventilated, no light, just dark ceilings, and a factory. Factory, come on guys. Product, product. You're making product. You sell product by the million. What does it do to you? It kills you. You stop being a human being. Because you're a machine. And we're not made to be machines. We're made to have an identity, an expression. We are made to have something very that special. So I was in that factory doing that all day. Oh, and I got so depressed so quickly. Okay, because, so I stopped. That was worth stopping. That was really <laughs> goodbye. Okay, and look for my talent. Look for my gift. And I went on looking until I saw my vision. It was 12 o'clock at night. It was my hometown. And I saw something extraordinary. Full moon, big trees, underneath this canopy of trees, a terrace. In the terrace, light. In the terrace with the lights, metro hotel, all dressed in black, carving and flambeing the crepe Suzette, carrying some beautiful cheese trays. And I just, the, the waiters all in purple jacket with a silver epaulette. It was like a ballet. It was elegant, it was beautiful, and there, I saw my vision. And at the age of 19, that's it. I want to be the craftsman, the chef, who creates this extraordinary food. And that was, I found my love, I found my expression. But life, you will find out, and I'm sure you already have, is never like you think it's going to turn out. It's always full of surprises. And we all fall, and we all hurt ourselves. And of course, our ability, our ability to get up and not to have too much self, uh, self emotional for your self pity, you have to stand up again and get up. And I ask, ask I want to have an interview to have the position of chef, a young chef in that establishment. I saw a man with grey eyes, a grey suit, who looked at me and he told me, How old are you? 19. What have you done in your life? What I've done. I said, no, we can't be a chef. You're too old. But if you want to, we'll put you as a cleaner. I said, yes, sir, I will take the job. And I started my working life as a general cleaner. And I clean <coughs> this establishment better than ever been cleaned by no one. And I, there was a huge mirror. It was a big, tall building. The mirrors were about 6 times bigger than that. And I would go up in ladders with vinegar and my newspaper and polishing those mirrors until they shine. And there was beauty and life into them. And the toilets have never been so clean. <laughs> they were extraordinarily beautiful, shiny. And the girls and boys would come and say, oh my God, that's special. Okay. And they loved me. They loved me for who I was. And then you, I cared about what I was doing. So then I cleaned so well, I was given a promotion. I became a glass washer. <laughs> and I cleaned my glasses. I developed some methods so fast. You can give me a glass, please, a, a, a towel. Glass and towel, yes, I'll show you. That's 40 years I've not done it. Huh? <laughs> don't, don't look at our glasses. <laughs> Alright. So first, take the corner. Of course, he takes the best linen. Not a traffic cloth <laughs> <laughs> like that. Then he takes that, you put, of course, you've got beautiful balloon glasses. Then you, security, you put your, your hand here so you don't cut yourself. You protect your hand. Push the cloth in here. Then, and all what to do. So the, there's no pressure on the glass. Remember, these glasses were all hand blown. Each of them was costing about 50 quid. They were long stem. They were delicate. They were beautiful. It was artwork. And I cleaned them. And they were shining. A bit of steam. Up. Oh, Perfect. Then same time, of course, when you have wine glasses, you have wine in it. So I would taste the wine, always coming from the customer, and write down my impression of the wine. I was writing the history of each of those grapes. 
by the time I was reading all the books written about food, food sex, food history, food science, food nutrition, food love, food family, food science, uh, nutrition, food, uh, everything connecting with food, this transmission of knowledge. Then I cleaned my glasses so well, at last, I was given a position as a young waiter. And I was given a beautiful Bordeaux jacket, the same one that I had seen in that terrace outside. And I was so proud of the silver epaulette. And I, was, I felt so proud. And I, was, and I became a young waiter. And I looked after the guests. And I immediately understood that a great restaurant is not just about food. A great restaurant is about an ensemble of things. It's about love. It's about teamwork. It's about creating a beautiful environment which celebrate oneself. Celebrate joy, celebrate life, because that's what it is. That table is a fantastic symbol of, of, of togetherness. Share, we sit, we argue with each other, we play footsies on the table, we <laughs> have fun, we, etc. That's what that table is. Eating is not just filling one's belly. Eating is not just about saying, oh, my little belly, all I earn is for you. That's one part of it. In eating, you talk about produce. Talking about the farm, it's about your landscape, your own heritage, your own soul. Okay, so I learned all that. And I was reading every night. And I was cooking for my friends every night. And I understood immediately when I was, as a young waiter that being a waiter was probably the most worthy, the most important profession in my life. I was making people happy. I was partaking to give them a memory to stay in their life all forever, forever. Then things went very wrong, very, very wrong. Because life is like that. I've got to prepare ourselves for it, guys. And it's not funny sometimes. Sometimes it's happy, and it lasts 10 minutes, and then it's something, bam, which happened. OK, so I, because I was a waiter, I could taste the sauces. Remember, I wanted to be a chef. That was my vision. So I was coming closer to the kitchen because from a cleaner, I became a glass washer, glass washer to a young commie, and I could see, I could enter the kitchen, see this temple, and meet the chef and taste the sauces and exchange my ideas with my colleagues, which I saw my colleagues. It was a big mistake. They were my, not my colleagues, they were the chefs. They were the creative mind okay, of that business. And I was telling the chef, who was a Volgia, as tall as that, a beastly thing with dark eyes, with moustache which could bristle <laughs> above it and move when he was angry. He was a bad man. He would hit people. But I still saw him as my colleague. And I would share my ideas about what I was tasting. And I would tell the chef, your sauce is a bit salty, no? Or it's a bit too rich. And I could see his moustache going. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I, it was not to, to, to anger him, not to provoke him. I just wanted to have a conversation about food. It was a wrong move. And one day, I was about to tell him that his sauces was a bit too sharp or too rich. I took a copper pan at full force, smashed it in my face. I went on the floor, immediately to hospital. I had a broken jaw, two broken teeth, broken egos for sure. <laughs> then the boss came to see me, and he started to shout at me. I said, Remo, you cannot do that. The chef is God. The chef cannot do wrong. wrong. He put a roof over my head, protects my family, you know, give, sends them to school, and you tell him he cannot cook. <laughs> of course, I could hardly argue, argue, <laughs> when you have wires down your face, and a jaw which is purple, and two teeth which hurt so much. And on that day, he told me, so then he had his monologue. I said, Remo, I have seen you, and you're a good young man. I admire you. You've done it the wrong way, but I admire you, and I'm going to help you. In France, you're dead. Forget about it. So imagine to be dead at the age of 20. <laughs> eh, not easy, eh? But that's the way it was. And then he said to me, but I will help you. I will find you a place in England. So imagine, at the age of 20, I lost my job. I lost my job. 
a los tutis, a los maigos. Then I was exiled to England, the perfect Albion. And I took my little suitcase. 